Ladies and gentlemen, I am very grateful to all of you for joining us this evening. I am Daniel McCarthy, and I am the director of the Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship Program at the Fund for American Studies. This dinner celebrates 25 years of the Novak Program, as well as also celebrating the lifetime achievements of P.J. O'Rourke and the launch of a new fellowship that the Fund for American Studies has created in conjunction with the family of Joseph Rago and with the Wall Street Journal called the Joseph Rago Memorial Fellowship for Excellence in Journalism. Now, the Fund for American Studies, which is home to both the Novak Program and the Rago Fellowship, is uh, 50 years old as of last year. It supplies not only fellowships, but also internships to young people across the country, uh, as well as having several international programs. We have here tonight uh, several leaders of the Fund for American Studies, including our president, Roger Ream, and our chairman, Randy Teague. The Fund for American Studies is extremely grateful for your support, which makes possible the Novak Fellowships and the new Joseph Rago Memorial Fellowship for Excellence in Journalism. And this dinner is a celebration of what the young people we have been sponsoring for the last 25 years have achieved and what our new class of fellows will go on uh, to accomplish. Before we begin, I want to say thank you to a couple of sponsors, in particular, Mr. Don Smith and the Smith Family Foundation for making uh, possible our gathering here at the Metropolitan Club. I also wish to thank News Corp, Dow Jones, The Wall Street Journal, and the Rago family for making possible the new Rago Fellowship, which I think is going to really... <laughs> it's going to have a tremendously salutary impact, not only on journalism, but I think uh, on the state of our political discourse in this country. Well, we begin our program by introducing our new Novak Fellows for 2018 and 2019. I'm going to ask them to congregate here by the side of the stage so that we can introduce them one by one and present each one of them with a plaque that will commemorate the beginning of their fellowship. The first of the fellows we will introduce tonight is Tim Alberta. His project is the 10-year war, making sense of the modern GOP. Tim is currently the chief political correspondent for Politico magazine. Tim? Good evening. Energetic crowd. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Good. All right. Fire it up. That was not the beer that made me trip on the stage, I promise you. The lighting is a little dim. Uh, well, thank you for having me, and I'll be real brief. Uh, my project, a, the Cliff Notes version, is I moved to Washington in the twilight of the George W. Bush presidency, and I've spent the last 10 years covering the Republican Party, and it is very much my belief that what we have seen in the last... Uh, 24 months with the rise of Donald Trump is that Trump is much more a, a consequence than a cause of the better part of a decade of, of not just political transformation, but significant cultural upheaval and socioeconomic dislocation and disruptment. And what we are living through now is something that I want to be able to chronicle in real time as the Republican Party transitioned and changed and transformed quite a bit between 2008, at the end of the George W. Bush presidency, and 2018 through this November's midterm elections, trying to capture that 10-year window of Republican Party history so that one day my three young children, including my youngest son, who was just born a couple of weeks ago, will have some idea of what their weary father was experiencing every day, chasing around DC and covering this very peculiar and very fascinating time in our political history. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Our second Novak Fellow for 2018-2019 is Christine Ember, and her party is rethink her her um, project rather is rethink sex, 
the not-so-modest proposal. Uh, Christine is currently uh, an opinion columnist and uh, editorial uh, contributor at the Washington Post. Christine? Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for that uh, introduction, which hopefully doesn't overpromise on what I'm going to deliver. <laughs> but I think as we've all seen, and as many of us have probably been watching today, uh, the Me Too movement, which started at about this time last year, has changed a lot in American society. It has forced people to rethink their past norms. It's caused an outpouring of revelations about how both men and women are dissatisfied by today's sexual climate. But it's also opened up a unique opportunity in which we might be able, both traditionalists and the most ardent feminists, rethink our post-sexual revolution norms and see if we can come to a better idea of what a healthy society looks like, what a healthy sexual ethic could be. So yes, rethinking sex, as we said, it's not a very modest proposal, but I do hope that I can add something to that conversation. And I'm thankful that the Novak program will allow me to do that. Thank you, Christine. The uh, third Novak fellow we'd like to introduce uh, for our 2018-2019 class is Kurt Mills. He's currently the in-house reporter for the National Interest. Thanks. So uh, my project is going to be on foreign policy, hopefully a uh, compliment to Tim's project. Um, in short, you had a uh, president, Donald Trump, who ran against uh, George Bush's Iraq war in the most caustic of terms, and then appointed his national security advisor as John Bolton, probably the most vociferous living champion of said war. Why did he do that? Read to find out. Thank you, Kurt. Well, next I would like to introduce Joel B. Pollock. He is the Alumni Fund Fellow uh, uh, of our, among our Novak Fellows for 2018-2019. The Alumni Fund is very important because uh, it's really the contributions of the 150 or so uh, Novak alumni that make possible uh, so much of what we do with these fellowships. And the Alumni Fund Fellowship uh, commemorates that in particular. So, Joel? Thank you, and thank you to the foundation, to the Rago family. Uh, thank you also to the many writers in the audience. I read your work, and it's good to see some familiar faces. Uh, those of us who write for a living are fortunate enough to do this, uh, just have a passion for expressing ourselves about the world, and it's just such a precious opportunity and honor to be given this award. I'm working on a series of articles about water fights in California. And as bad as the political fight was today in Washington, you haven't really seen a fight until you've seen a fight over water in California. <laughs> and it's so intensely crazy that when I started my work on this project at the beginning of September, I went to the Central Valley to document a fight between farmers and environmentalists and city dwellers over the San Joaquin Valley's water. The fact that I showed up in town to write about it made the local paper. <laughs> so they're already watching who's watching them, and this is going to hopefully shed some light on some really, really complicated debates about how we live, how we survive in a republic of thirst, which is, which is California. And as a conservative, it challenges some of my own notions because so much of private enterprise in California depends in subtle and not so subtle ways on public infrastructure. So it's very interesting. Thank you again for the opportunity to write about it. Thank you, Joel. And I should mention that Joel is currently senior editor at large at Breitbart News. 
The next Novak fellow we will introduce, whose project is The Unattended, A Generation Devastated by Tough Love, is Kenneth R. Rosen, who's currently a senior news assistant at the New York Times. Good evening. Um, I'm very thankful and honored to uh, receive the Novak Fellowship. My project uh, book forthcoming from Little A in 2020 is about the tough love uh, redirection industry for at, uh, wayward teens. Uh, as someone who attended these programs for uh, 288 days when I was 16 and 17, I hope to chronicle the journey of four students who um, traversed these programs and then later in life ended up worse off than where they came from. So thank you again to uh, the fund and everyone here. Next we have Leela Labresco Sargent. Her project is Protest as Witness, the Counterculture Culture War. Now she is the author most recently of the Benedict Option, uh, sorry, Building the Benedict Option, uh, a guide to gathering two or three together in his name. Leah? Often if you attend or uh, pass by a protest, the protesters and the counter-protesters are almost impossible to tell apart unless you're close enough to read the signs. But I think there's a narrowing of our imagination of how opposition can be offered when the most frequent choice is to take to the streets and the poster board and not much else. I'm gonna be writing six profiles of people or organizations that are offering protest in the form of positive witness to the cause they're fighting for starting with a former Planned Parenthood uh, clinic manager who changed her mind about abortion and began a ministry to other workers in the abortion industry, telling them that she would help them leave their jobs if they were considering doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. And last but far from least is Carrie Travis. Her project is Not For Sale, Liberty, Responsibility, and the role, the role of conservatism in the fight against human trafficking. Kerry is currently working at the Carolina Journal in North Carolina. Kerry? First of all, I want to say deeply and from the bottom of my heart, thank you to everyone who is here tonight, and thank you to you, Daniel and to the Fund for American Studies for providing this amazing fellowship for journalists like me and my fellows to do our projects and hopefully contribute something to the world. My project is based on some research that I began last year. Essentially, human trafficking, sex and labor, is indeed a problem in the United States, a problem that most people don't realize is actually as prevalent as it is because it is difficult for many reasons to gather data and to measure the actual impact. Additionally, what I have found so far is that government policies, no surprise, are inefficient when it comes to fighting trafficking, and no surprise, nonprofits also get caught up in politics when they're talking about fighting trafficking. So, I will be writing a book in a series of articles from that book that will seek to look at these gaps and propose some very practical solutions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carrie. And those are our seven wonderful Novak Fellows for 2018-2019. And now to bring us up to dinner and to give an invocation is Kathy Windells, who's a former trustee of the Fund for American Studies. I, I have to say that after what we witnessed on Capitol Hill today, I'm very, very happy to be in this room with all of you um, and not elsewhere. So, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we gather in fellowship with a focus on the future. We honor talented young journalists as Robert Novak Journalism Fellows, and we present our first Joseph Rago Fellowship, 
We do this ever mindful of the past, most especially thinking of Robert Novak and Joe Rago. We think of the long, distinguished career of Bob Novak and the all too short life of the remarkable and the remarkable journalistic achievement of our beloved son, brother, colleague, and friend, Joe Rago. Rest in peace, Joe. I would like to offer my late husband's favorite grace, which was written by John Milton when he was 15. Let us pray. Let us with a gladsome mind praise the Lord, for he is kind. For his mercies I endure, ever faithful, ever sure. Amen. We are about to move into uh, the second part of tonight's programming, where we will focus on uh, both uh, lifetime achievement and also the achievement of a young journalist who was taken from us at a prematurely young age. Before we get to that part of the program, however, I'd briefly like to ask uh, all of our uh, current and uh, Novak uh, fellows and also our Novak alumni to stand up for a moment and be recognized. So, Novak, Novak alumni and current fellows, please, please stand. And uh, some of them may be shy, some of them may not have uh, gained all the recognition that they uh, are deserving of, but uh, I hope if you meet uh, a fellow or an alumnus at your table, uh, you'll talk to them about uh, their experience with the program and how much they recommend it to others. Well now, we are about to hear from uh, some of the most distinguished uh, journalists in our country, people who have, uh, through humor, people through incisive uh, opinion writing, and people through careful investigative reporting, have uncovered all sorts of stories which have transformed national discourse. To present uh, the Career Achievement Award, the 2018 Phillips Award, I'm going to introduce you to Andrew Ferguson. Andrew Ferguson, many of you, in fact, I think all of you are well aware, is someone whose byline is a guarantee of quality. He is currently the national correspondent at the Weekly Standard. He's the author of The Land of Lincoln, and he's someone whose extensive experience as a journalist covers everything from Time Magazine to National Review to Bloomberg News. Andy, I'd like to bring you up here to present the Career Achievement Award to P.J. O'Rourke. Thank you for that very brief introduction. Um, uh, I'm really quite um, honored to be here and especially to meet the Ragos and I was a great admirer of Joe's and um, and uh, so it's 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 quite an honor to meet you and see you. Uh, when I told my son who's known PJ for all of his life that I was going to be talking about him tonight at this for this award he said oh well you've got to tell him about Kevin and I had forgotten all about Kevin, but he, he reminded me. Uh, Kevin was a precocious young man, a high school student, whose parents had brought him on a weekly standard cruise. Um, he was also kind of an odd kid. He was so odd that he didn't mind that his parents had brought him on a weekly standard cruise. Um, in these rotating dinners that they have on these um, cruises, he ended up at my table one night and I introduced myself to him. And he said, oh, oh I've, I've read you, you're a good writer. And I, said, I was gonna thank him and he said, you're not as good as P.J. O'Rourke. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, P.J. and I, we kind of do different, he said, no, you're just not as good as he is. <laughs> and he, I guess he saw my, he said, don't feel bad, nobody's as good. And of course, after I picked him up off the floor, um, I had to admit that he was right. Most writers actually hold PJ in awe. Uh, years ago when Bjorn Borg was the unquestioned tennis champion of the world and he was beating everyone in sight, one of his defeated rivals said, we're all out there playing tennis, he's doing something else. And a lot of us feel that way about PJ. It's impossible really to measure the influence he's had on the conservative movement back when there was a conservative movement. Uh, 25 years ago, I remember Grover Norquist, 
uh, told me that the two greatest assets conservatives had in influencing the culture were Arnold Schwarzenegger and P.J. O'Rourke, <laughs> which is, think of the cage match. that could, could um, In fact, I don't think there's a conservative journalist or a p political journalist, in fact, who at one time didn't try and emulate P.J., which is always a mistake. But that's the effect he's had on people. I heard Greg Gutfeld, who said he was going to be here, because I had a great insulting joke if he was here, but I don't think he's here. Anyway, I heard uh, Greg say on his podcast the other day that when he was younger, how great it was to realize as a conservative that you were on the same side as the funniest writer in America. And that really is what PJ is. All the other funny writers in America agree. Um, Dave Barry, uh, Christopher Buckley, uh, not Andy Borowitz, though, because <laughs> he's not funny. Um, so you might be familiar with the outline of his career, so I'll just uh, sketch it out briefly. PJ got his big start in, at National Lampoon in the 1970s. Eventually, he became editor-in-chief. During that period, PJ managed to write several dozen articles that guaranteed he would never run for office or hold any position of public trust <laughs> in the United States, anyway. After the lampoon, he had a uh, brief fling with screenwriting, working with Rodney Dangerfield on a movie called Easy Money, which I think explains why you did it, the, the title. Uh, but by then he was a freelancer. This is one of the things writers mean when they talk about the greatness of PJ. He's made a living for 40 years without actually having a job. Yes, we can all aspire to that. Uh, he's published nearly 20 books, many of which have been bestsellers, all of which are hilarious. His Foreign coverage uh, pieces for Rolling Stone of what President Trump calls hell holes. At least I think hell holes is the word he used, wasn't it? Like heck holes, maybe, or something. Um, anyway, the pieces really made him famous. Uh, but what I've really mar marveled at from then to now is the incredible range of his writing. Early on, he decided to do something no humorist had tried with such success. He would try to be funny about the most boring subjects in the world. Government, for example, finance, economics. His book on government, Parliament of Horrors, is not only the funniest book ever written on government, it's also one of the most perceptive. PJ realized how and why government was so boring that there was an iron rule of government, which was the last one awake gets to spend all the money. So you've all read his stuff, so you don't need for me or, or for Kevin to tell you how good and enduring it is. One reason his stuff will last is because he puts himself into every line, and his self is very amiable. There's a deep reservoir of human sympathy in everything P.J. writes, unless it's about John Kerry. <laughs> so instead, I'll close with a word or two about who he is as a man. From someone who has known him for more than 40 years. In fact, I met PJ when I was in kindergarten. Um, PJ is kind. I remember an a event many years ago when our, our dear friends, the Eberstadts, Nick and Mary Eberstadt, were having some kind of gathering, and PJ had just moved into the apartment building where we all lived, and um, he came into the social occasion there, and they had a little toddler, uh, their son Rick was maybe two and a half, and uh, he's a very sweet boy, and he just ran right at PJ, even though he'd never seen him before, and gave him a big hug around the legs, and then lifted up the flap of his coat pocket and barfed. <laughs> now, many people would react differently from this, but PJ just sort of lowered the flap, and patted, kept up the witty, repartee, and uh, I never did see him wear that jacket again. Uh, um, PJ is brave. A few years ago, PJ got cancer. Uh, it scared the hell out of all of us, but he decided to write about it. I think the piece I saw was in the LA Times. 
I have, he wrote, of all the inglorious things, a malignant hemorrhoid. What color bracelet does one wear for that? <laughs> and where does one wear it? PJ is a realist. He wrote about a lot of political issues in his great book called Don't Vote, it just encourages the bastards. Uh, and he dealt with almost all of these in depth until you came across the chapter on climate change. It was one page long, mostly an empty page. Um, and the first sentence was, there's not a goddamn thing you can do about it. <laughs> and by, by way of explanation, he adds, there are 1.3 billion people in China and they all want a Buick. <laughs> PJ is forgiving. Uh, one more personal story. Uh, years ago, before PJ and his saintly, long-suffering wife, uh, Tina, got married, there was a period there where they split up for a while, as happens with couples. And PJ came over to our house with a date uh, for dinner. And um, my son, Gillum, loves Tina, loved him loved her, his always, she would read to him and bounce him on her lap and everything. And so when this poor woman came in the door, he started giving her the hairy eyeball. He was about two and a half, three years old. And didn't take his eyes off her. I was starting to get a little worried. We sat down to dinner and uh, my son started looking at PJ and said, PJ, where is Tina? And this woman froze. PJ looked down at his mashed potatoes and didn't say anything. And so she said, this woman, um, who's Tina? <laughs> and my son screwed up his face, said, Tina's him's wife. He loves Tina so much. I saw them kissing. The woman did not say another word for the rest of the evening. In fact, I don't think she may have spoken for months after that. Anyway, of course, PJ forgave my son because after all of this, it did send him back to Tina. In fact, the highest compliment I can give PJ is to say that Tina Mallon married him. So, it's my honor to present this award to Tina O'Rourke's husband. Gosh, thank you. I, uh, I was, you know, a little worried as a humorist that if you get an award, you're obviously not offending enough people. Um, I, must have, I, I must have left some of you out, but I, I am deeply grateful and, and, and deeply appreciative. And I'm deeply appreciative of all of you who are here in this room. Um, here we are. Conservatives, classical liberals, free market libertarians, whatever, whatever people want to call us. But you know, whatever people call us, they conceive of us, we people in this room, they conceive of us as being political. And this is a misconception. It's an evil conception. A Rosemary's baby of a conception because <laughs> politics is the devil's spawn. To be a conservative, a real conservative, a true classical liberal, is to engage in political con contraception, to prevent the overpopulation of the world with politics. We don't want all of life pregnant with politics. We want political chastity. Politicians should take a cold shower. Politicians should click off the dating app. Politicians should stay home and curl up Curl up with a good book, preferably Free to Choose by Milton and Rose Friedman. 
You know, we, we, we stand for individual liberty, and individual liberty is about bringing things together. Politics is about dividing things up. I was speaking of pregnancy. Politics would have us make babies by putting the women on this side of the room and the men on that side of the room, uh, while politicians stand in the middle taxing and regulating the sperm and the eggs. You know? All good things come from individual liberty. Goodness itself is an individual matter. Consider the death of Socrates. Now, what would have happened to that, that charming old bloke, the lovable, eccentric, that, that, full of silly questions, if Socrates himself had gone around Athens asking each individual Athenian, should I be condemned to death? Individuals would never have killed Socrates. They had to become a political mob first. And what always comes to the fore in a mob? It's mobsters. Uh, the alternative right and KKK bedsheets. They're such knuckleheads, I'll bet that fitted bedsheets in, in floral patterns is all they could find. Or black clad antifas in, in, in their little ninja jammies expressing their First Amendment rights by smashing windows in Berkeley. Uh, the hallmark of politics is the expansion of political power. And political power has it has expanded in size and expense. One third of the world's GDP is now spent by politicians in government. One out of every three things that we make is grabbed by governments. If your cat has three kittens, one of them is a government agent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> political power has expanded in scope. Political uh, 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 politics it casts its net over every little aspect of life. Nothing is so private that it isn't tangled up in politics, as I think we saw today, you know. But transgender bathrooms, we all know that politics is crap. Now we find out where to take one is a political issue, you know. And politics just keeps expanding. A ask politicians any question. Uh, are middle class wages stagnant? Are visits to the doctor's office too expensive? Is the weather getting worse? Should, my, should I get my dog spayed? Uh, and politicians always have the same answer. Politics needs to be expanded in size and scope. Politicians say we need more big fat rules and regulations. We need more big fat politics. It is over when the fat lady sings. I mean, politics has become such an obese, operatic performer, warbling so loudly that none of us bit players can be heard, and so fat that, 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 that we're all, those bit players are being shoved into the orchestra pit of angry political partisanship. When are politicians going to learn that politics is a two-way street? The politicians create a powerful, huge, heavy, and unstoppable monster truck of a government, then those politicians get all shocked and upset when another politician, whom they despise, gets behind the wheel, turns the truck around, and runs them over. You know? We need to make the truck smaller. You know, yank the engine and install foot pedals. Make government into a kitty car so that the worst it can do is smack us in the shins. You know, you know we treasure democracy. Done, and democracy can shield us from tyranny, but alas, democracy cannot shield us from politics as we saw in 2016 and as we're about to see again in, in, in November's midterm elections. As H.L. Mencken said, democracy is the theory that the common people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. Which is, of course, what, 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 what happened in, in, in 2016, and it's easy to see how it happened. I mean, elite politicians are bossy, preachy, smug, domineering, self-righteous, self-impressed, self-serving, and selfish. Hillary was their queen. Meanwhile, Trump, you know, he, he, he didn't sound like an elite politician. He sounded like an ordinary guy, an ordinary guy who was about 10 beers ahead of Brett Kavanaugh, you know? And, and Trump, Trump doesn't even drink, you know? As, as for being elite, Trump may be a rich guy, a self-proclaimed member of the 1%, but there's nothing elite about him. He looks and acts like, like a resort timeshare condominium salesman who won the lottery, you know? I mean, 
Thing is, though, you can imagine playing around a golf with, 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 with Trump. I have it on good authority. He doesn't cheat any worse than I do. Now imagine playing a round of golf with Hillary Clinton. She has got 20 Harvard graduate caddies who've read all the books about golf but have never been on the links. They spend the whole match telling you, not her, what club to use, and the Secret Service is there to make sure that you take their advice to hit from the middle of the fairway with a sand wedge. After your chip shot, the cup and the pin somehow get moved closer to Hillary's lie. Lie, what an appropriate term to use in any game that Hillary is playing. And the scorecard mysteriously winds up on Hillary's personal email server, you know? <laughs> Hillary versus Trump. I mean, that, that's what we get from politics. And now we're getting it again with the midterm election. We've got politics like the Carolinas have floods and with similar benef beneficent effects. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her fellow progressives, they want to make America more like Europe. Great idea. Great idea, because Europe has had a swell track record for more than 100 years now, ever since Archduke Ferdinand's car got a flat in Sarajevo in 1914, you know? Make America more like Europe? Where do you even go to get all the Nazis and commies and 90 million dead people that it would take to make America more like Europe, you know? And after the election, what will happen? I don't know. I don't know, except that we'll have even more politics. Maybe Trump and Putin will, will switch jobs, you know? I mean, uh, Russia's got a lot of real estate that needs developing, such as Crimea and next Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. And Putin, Putin could fix uh, America's healthcare system by replacing it with the, the Russian healthcare system, which is, uh, consists of vodka and Marlboros. Um, <laughs> I have been covering politics for 46 years, and I have never seen so much venom, so much bile, so much anger and bitterness, so much vicious, stubborn inability to work together, and that's the Republicans. Uh, I hear the Democrats uh, that they have problems too. Uh, I, you know, I, I have, I've always said that we have two, two parties in this country. We have the stupid party and the silly party. Now, I'm stupid, so I, I usually I vote for the stupid party. I, I vote Republican because Republicans have fewer ideas, um, <laughs> but not few enough, but not, especially lately. I mean, slap tariffs on the Chinese just in time for Christmas so that Santa comes, you know, comes down the chimney with a sack full of American shale oil instead of fun, you know, made in China toys, you know. Build a wall on the Mexican border. Um, stock market tip, go long on the Mexican ladder industry. Um, <laughs> actually, I, I've got I've got a, a free market, classical liberal solution for the immigrant problem. Uh, we don't need a wall. We need gates with turnstiles and ticket takers. You know, the right way to limit immigration and make people in foreign countries pay for it is to charge admission to the United States. I mean, Disney World, that costs $100 a day. There, there, there are 12 million illegal immigrants in America. By my calculation, we're leaving $438 billion a year on the table, you know? Plus, America's got lots more attractions than Disney World. You know, I mean, NASDAQ roller coaster is much scarier than Space Mountain. Uh, furthermore, think what we could make from the, the, the food, the toy, and the souvenir concessions. But, you say, what if people won't leave after we let them in? Well, we'll ask Disney. Disney doesn't seem to have much trouble clearing the theme park, you know, and it's closing time. And we, you know, we don't need a wall. We need to dress our border agents in giant mouse suits. <clears throat> you know... All politicians work themselves into a lather proving the benefits of political power. And using that politician logic, I can prove anything. I can prove that shooting convenience store clerks stimulates the economy. Because jobs are created in the high-paying domestic manufacturing sector at gun and ammunition factories, additional emergency medical technicians, security guards, health care providers, and morticians are hired. The unemployment rate is lowered as job seekers fill new openings on convenience store night shifts, and money stolen from the convenience store cash registers stimulates the economy where stimulus is most needed in low-income neighborhoods where the people who shoot convenience store clerks go to buy their crack. I mean, considering all the good it does, I am simply flabbergasted that everyone in the House and Senate isn't smoking crack and shooting convenience store clerks this very minute. 
instead of just smoking crack. <clears throat> but I don't want to leave you this evening. Uh, I, I thank you so much. I appreciate it so much that I don't want to leave you in a mood of gloom and despair. So uh, let's, let's take a, a look at the bright side of life. Um, and the, um, the bright side is that, that for all the, my criticism, the American political system is always going to take good care of us. Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan had a little story he used to tell about how politics will always take good care of us. Um, kind of an old story, but I'm an old guy, so I, I get to tell old stories. But Reagan said politics is going to take, always going to take good care of us the way the farmer took good care of the pig. See, a traveling salesman is staying overnight with a farm family. When the family sits down to eat, the salesman notices that there's a pig having dinner right with them, seated right at the table. And the pig has three medals hanging around his neck and a peg leg. And the salesman says, uh, 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 I see you have a pig right here at the table having dinner with you. Yep, says the farmer. That's because that's a very special pig. You see those medals around his neck? Well, a first medal, that's, that's from when our youngest son fell in the pond and he was drowning and that pig swam out and saved his life. And the second medal, that, that, that's from when the barn caught fire and our little daughter was trapped in there and that pig ran inside, carried her out, saved her life. And that third medal, that, that's from when our oldest boy was cornered in the stockyard by a mean bull and that pig ran under the fence and bit the bull on the tail and saved the boy's life. And the traveling salesman goes, wow, yeah. So I, 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 I can see why you let that pig sit right at the table. And I can see why you let him have dinner with you. Uh, but how do you get the peg leg? Well, says the farmer, a pig like that, you don't eat him all at once. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you, PJ. That was absolutely wonderful, just as we would expect. You know, the uh, Wall Street Journal has a tradition of excellence that stretches back generations. Its editorial page has long been in the most capable of hands, from Vermont C. Royster to Robert, H. Bar to Robert L. Bartley. And in fact, the contributors to the Wall Street Journal's editorial page and opinion section have been outstanding as well. They've included not only Robert Novak, but also the extraordinarily talented young man that we're about to hear about. Joseph Rago won the Pulitzer Prize before he turned 30. He was hired by the Wall Street Journal right out of uh, his college, Dartmouth. Joseph Rago was an extraordinary individual who touched the lives not only of his colleagues at the Wall Street Journal, but also of all of his readers. His work on Obamacare, on the Affordable Care Act, as it was called, uh, was what won him the Pulitzer Prize, and it was something that really led American discourse and led many of the insightful criticisms uh, of what had been the signature legislation of the past decade. The tradition of excellence at the Wall Street Journal, which was carried on by Joseph Rago, continues to this day, and it's something that will continue far into the future through the new memorial fellowship that has been created in the name of Joseph Rago. Joseph Rago was taken from us prematurely last year at the age of 34. He had an undiagnosed medical condition, and his loss was not only a loss to his family and to his colleagues, but to all of American journalism. The excellence of the Wall Street Journal is today in the hands of editorial page editor Paul Jagot. I will welcome Mr. Jagot to the podium to talk about not only the life of Joseph Rago, but also what his legacy means for American letters. Thank you, uh, Daniel, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, on behalf of the Wall Street Journal as we celebrate the collaboration with the Rago family and the Fund for American Studies. Uh, we at the Journal are the beneficiaries of uh, their generosity and of your generosity because we get the services of a promising young journalist for a year. Uh, we have him already working with us, Elliot Kaufman, and he's already uh, hit the ground running editing and uh, writing for us. Um, and if I can convince him not to go to law school, uh, maybe he'll, we'll have him as a lifetime, as a lifer 
as a journalist. I want to thank the Rago family for helping uh, to fund the fellowship. Uh, Paul and Nancy Rago are here, as well as uh, his sister Grace, uh, uh, brother Adam, and sister-in-law Megan. Thank you so very much for, for your uh, uh, generosity. We miss Joe every day, and so do our, our readers. Uh, thank you also to Roger Ream and the Fund for American Studies, uh, Daniel, uh, as well for the work that you do in helping uh, young journalists. So you saw the lineup before, awfully impressive. Uh, I wish I could speak as well as they do. Uh, 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 you've already given us, I think we have three of your former fellows on our staff. With Elliot, that's four. We need a fifth to get a basketball side. Uh, but that's a, that's a tremendous contribution when we're grateful. Uh, Thanks to, on my, on my staff, Kelly Eggers and uh, Brad Ralston and our, uh, for Dow Jones, who worked with uh, uh, the Rago family and, uh, and TFAS to put together the Rago Memorial Foundation Fellowship. And especially thanks to all of you donors. We really, we really do appreciate it. Uh, and you make the careers of uh, people who start with fellowships like this uh, possible. And I want to thank, in particular, my colleagues at Dow Jones and News Corp for their contributions uh, to, to, to the Rago Fellowship. So I've been, I've been uh, asked to talk tonight about a little bit about journalism, and I want to talk about the ways that Joe Rago thought about journalism, but I want to start with one of my own experiences. So some time ago at a kind of a large dinner like this, um, a young man approached me at the cocktail reception uh, introduced himself and said, uh, wow, I'm so thrilled to meet you. I read your stuff, I watch you on TV, and wow, it's great to meet you in person. So naturally, I felt a little puffed up. Uh, thanked him, we chatted for a minute or two. Then he said, well, I've got to go, but this has been great. Now I can tell all of my friends that I finally met Chris Matthews. That's a true story. And it's so humiliating in so many ways that I cannot begin to tell you. Now, uh, I tell that story because Joe Rago loved that story. Uh, to borrow one of Joe's favorite words, he found it hilarious. Not only because he liked to make fun of me or see me humbled, which to his credit he did, but also because he thought most journalists uh, think too highly of themselves and could use a little humbling too. Uh, after Joe had been with the journal for a while and on, on our staff, I asked him to, assess, uh, to uh, work with our interns, our summer interns. We call them Bartley Fellows after our former great boss, uh, Bob Bartley. And one piece of advice Joe always offered them was this, no one cares what you think. No one cares what you think. Now, I know some veteran columnists who I can think could use that advice, uh, but that's another story. Uh, but what Joe meant is that what readers really care about is what journalists can tell them about the world. They want to know what they can learn from us as journalists so that they can decide how to think for themselves. This is true as much for opinion writers as it is for reporters. Um, those of us who write opinion, uh, have the luxury of offering a point of view. Our bosses give us that luxury, that's terrific, but an opinion isn't very persuasive at all if all it is is an opinion. That's not journalism, that's Twitter. Uh, that's why Joe spent so much time reporting and filling his work with facts and anecdotes and statistics and arguments. He knew that his job was to help readers reach their own conclusions. And, not beat them into submission with his conclusions. Uh, Joe believed that journalism is important work, but shouldn't be self-important. Uh, Joe also knew that uh, this is really a wonderful time to be a, a journalist. Uh, there's a lot of angst now in our, in our industry about business models and how we're going to be able to pay a salary, and certainly with good reason. But the truth is that this is also just a great moment of opportunity. Uh, no one knows what, uh, what reader habits are going to be in the future. Nobody knows what business models will work. But we know readers and citizens are going to always want to know what's happening from sources they can trust. And Facebook and Google 
maybe soaking up 80% of the digital advertising market, but they are not sources that people can trust. That's our job. Joe understood that that's our job, to be sources that uh, people can trust. And Joe also knew that it was a great moment to be a journalist because of the ferment. PJ, with all due respect, politics is really a great story these days. And Donald Trump, whatever you think of him, is a great story. <laughs> now, Joe's desk at the Journal wasn't far from mine, and so I noticed once in 2015 that books started to arrive and pile up. They all seemed about to be about this fellow named Donald Trump. There were books by Donald Trump, books about Donald Trump, books by Ivanka Trump, uh, books by bit players on The Apprentice, uh, believe it or not. Joe read every one. Uh, now, I doubt he read them for the prose. Uh, he read them to understand what this crazy real estate developer and presidential candidate who defied convention yet somehow kept gaining support, what he was all about. And Joe came to me once and said he had read all of the Yelp reviews of Donald Trump's products, including Trump steaks, uh, Trump wine, which was on the expense account, by the way. <laughs> Elliot, that is not advice uh, to follow. Um, and, and Joe, he, and, and he came to me and said, I want to write a story about it. So I said, I wonder where this is going. But he wrote it, and it was, uh, and it was uh, re offered real insight into Trump, and it was also hilarious. Uh, so all of Joe's research, I think re all of that helped, the hard work he did helped Joe understand uh, and explain to readers kind of what this Trump fellow was all about. And it made Joe one of the first journalists around uh, in 2015 to say that Donald Trump just might be able to win the presidency. So this is also a great moment, and I think Joe understood this too to be a journalist, because so much is changing in our, in our world. These questions, ideas that used to be, we used to take for granted are now up for grabs. What does it mean to be an American? Is it a matter of uh, identity? Is it a matter of heritage, or is it still an idea? Uh, can we return to the rapid economic growth that we used to think is our birthright, but now has been in doubt? Can and should America continue to play the kind of role it's played in the world since World War II? These are great questions. They're up for debate. And our real great fortune, Elliot Kaufman's great fortune and your generation's great fortune, you get to think about these things, write about them every day. Um, it's really a great privilege. Um, I thought I'd end with a, with a little career advice to all of you Novak fellows and and Elliot, from one of my former editors, his name is Seth Lipsky. Now, in May 1983, I was covering the protests against Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines. But for some strange reason, I thought I still might like to go to law school. Uh, so I registered to take the LSAT, believe it or not, in Hong Kong. I was in Manila at the time. And I rather sheepishly asked uh, Lipsky, who was then the journal's foreign editor, if I could fly to Hong Kong and take the test. You can imagine how that conversation went. Remember, this was before email and PCs. And there was this long silence on the phone. And as Lipsky was wont to say, I'll get back to you. So I woke the next morning to find this message at the hotel reception desk <laughs> in Manila. Now, for you millennials, this is called a telex. <laughs> and it's how we used to communicate back in the Jurassic Age, <laughs> um, believe it or not. It's how we sent our stories and got them back. Anyway, Seth said that I could go to Hong Kong and take the LSAT. But first, I had to take Seth Lipsky's test for, quote, newspaper men who think they might want to be lawyers. <laughs> so here it is. Um, Quote, these questions are designed to test your aptitude for the legal profession. Please read them carefully. You will have 30 minutes to answer each one. Now keep in mind, this is 1983. Question one, the Soviet Union is invading Afghanistan. 
It is driving the peasants into underground tunnels and tossing incendiary devices after them. A million ref re uh, refugees are camped across the border. They are having trouble getting weapons and support. The world seems paralyzed to act. You want to help. You should. A, seek a writ of mandamus in federal court. <laughs> B, seek to have the Soviet behavior declared a crime. C, file a class action suit on behalf of the aggrieved parties. D, place Afghanistan under protection of chapter 11 of the bankruptcy code. <laughs> uh, E, advise your client to negotiate. The Lipsky SAT continued like this for some time. Uh, uh, several more questions, but I think you get the idea. I never did go to law school. Uh, I was shamed into not going to law school. Uh, so I would say, uh, don't get me wrong, some of my best friends are lawyers, Jay, okay? <laughs> but uh, journalism is more fun. Uh, so congratulations, Yelly Kaufman, on your Rego uh, Fellowship uh, as you begin your career in journalism. We're delighted to have you at the journal. Uh, and if you ever think you might want to be a lawyer, I can introduce you to Lipsky. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Paul Rago, Joe's father. Good evening, everybody, and, and welcome. On behalf of the Rago family, let me ex begin by expressing my profound sense of gratitude to all of you who have gathered here tonight and who have contributed so generously to the Joseph Rago Memorial Fellowship. We are overwhelmed by your friendship and your kind notes. We hope that this fellowship will serve as a permanent remembrance of Joe's contributions, his unrealized potential, and as a celebration of the ideals he embraced. We especially thank family members who have traveled long distances to be with us. I think it is safe to say that Joe would have been extremely uncomfortable with all the attention showered on him tonight. To that I can only say, Sorry, Joe, you deserve it. As I understand it, the primary role of a rule of um, dinner speeches are to be eloquent, humorous, and brief. The first two rules are desirable. The last one is compulsory. Eloquence and humor are beyond my grasp, so I'll do the best with brevity. And I must admit some trepidation about having so many journalists in the audience. So if I say something trite, uh, I do hope you grade on the curve. So, congratulations first to the Novak Fellows. You are entering a distinguished fraternity of colleagues that demonstrate excellence of the Novak Fellowship at TFAS is something we hope to emulate in the Rago Fellowship. Congratulations to Elliot as well. More on, uh, will be, Dan will, will provide some more information on your excellence. Excellence is never an accident. Without the vision and the support of the leadership of News Corp, the Dow Jones Incorporated, and the Wall Street Journal, none of this would have been possible. Roger Ream, Dan McCarthy, and others at TAFAS have been equally inspiring in their dedication, compassion, and hard work. Kelly Eggers at the Journal was absolutely tireless in her efforts working with us to make our vision a reality. Thank you, Kelly. Regretfully, I am, know I am admitting dozens of people behind the scenes who helped make this happen. And a very special thanks to Paul Jago for his kind words and for serving so ably as a mentor to Joe. As a father, I couldn't have hoped for a better role model for Joe. Nancy and I are forever in your debt. Remember, to paraphrase William Emerson, who, um, at some point in our lives, we realize we're going to be gone a lot longer than we're here. Memories of who we are will fade. However, the memories of what we stood for will endure. So it is fitting that this fellowship in Joe's memory, in Joe's name, will ensure that future generations of journalists will, can begin their careers with the best editorial board on the planet. 
Nearly anyone can capture society's attention, but it's far more difficult to capture their imagination. Joe captured your imagination. He made the complex understandable. He presented arguments with an uncommon clarity, guided by principle, and with a much appreciated wit. Joe's first publication, written while he was in high school, was, it, was his admission essay to Dartmouth. It was published by Princeton Review in the book called College Essays That Made a Difference. In it, he said, perhaps somewhat prophetically, the pace of geological change, measurable in human timescales, reminds us that all life is fleeting. Live life fully. Let no moments pass unappreciated. Enjoy what we have and find the august world we live in delightful. Joe's body is no longer with us, but his spirit resides in those of us who knew him. And through this fellowship, we hope that the ideals he held, his spirit, will continue to be expressed. Integrity, loyalty, dedication, fortitude, fairness, humility, and most importantly, kindness. These qualities are all within our grasp. Now, there have been many moving tributes written about Joe, both in the media and directly to us. We can't begin to say thanks. But one of the best tributes was prepared by the journal editorial report. In my unbiased opinion, the journal editorial report is the best news program on TV. It is authentic and genuine. The panelists are as nice in person as they appear to be on TV, and by the way, the host isn't too bad. Each week, the program ends with a series, of, a set of hits and misses. On August 5th, 2017, they summarized one of their biggest misses, a poignant tribute to Joe. Thanks to Regina Rogers for producing this and Paul for uh, narrating what you're about to see. Among the many tributes to Joe, this one stands out as perhaps the best and most moving. Thank you again to all who have made this dream possible. There is a tremendous burden upon all of us, uh, but particularly upon the young man to whom I'm about to introduce you, but it is a joyous burden. It is the burden of living up to the example set by Joseph Rago, who is not only an outstanding journalist, perhaps one of the greatest of his generation, but who is also, as a human being, a model to all of those he met. His kindness was proverbial, and it's something that lives on after him. I wish to introduce you today to the young man who is beginning the continuation of Joseph Rago's legacy, work, and accomplishments. Elliot Kaufman has just recently graduated from Stanford University. He comes originally from Toronto, Canada, and he has been published even before he became the Joseph Rago Fellow at the Wall Street Journal. He's been published in a variety of outlets. He was an intern for National Review. He's written for Stanford Magazine, First Things, Commentary, and a number of other publications. One of the great pleasures of my job is being able to mentor and help to guide young people such as Elliot Kaufman. Elliot, please come to the stage. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, at the outset, I really must thank Mr. and Mrs. Rago. Uh, Paul and Nancy, I'm so grateful for the opportunity, and I promise to do all I can to make the absolute most of it. Um, I really do feel blessed. Uh, not only do I get to work with the Fund for American Studies, which is a pleasure, uh, and, and for the Wall Street Journal editorial page, which is a dream. But I also get to do my part to carry on Joe's tremendous legacy. Um, I recently spent an afternoon speaking to a group of, con of um, conservative college freshmen, many of them aspiring journalists. Uh, they wanted to know what to do. Uh, 
Well, from my own experiences with collegiate journalism, I had plenty to tell them about what not to do. But when it came to giving them a real answer, I said simply, be like Joe Rago. Follow his advice, cited in the New Criterion magazine recently, that when the reality is already so ridiculous as to discredit itself, there's no need for an inflammatory response. I told them, read his college articles. You'll see in them that you know, Joe didn't hate the institution that helped nourish him. He pointed out its flaws, but no, he loved it for its strengths. Um, he wanted to learn more about it. Uh, in, his, in his college writings, uh, he balanced the urgings of the head and the heart in order to try to make things better for those who came after him. He really did. And now, through his wonderful parents, through the Fund for American Studies, which does so much to support great journalism, and through the Wall Street Journal, where, above all, Joe thrived, I now feel like Joe is giving me a shot to succeed as a young editor and writer. I'm honored to be the Joseph Rago Memorial Fellow. Thank you so much. I'm Roger Ream, president of the Fund for American Studies. Uh, and I, in the 60 seconds, while we're still gathered here, I just want to say uh, a couple of things. Uh, we'll all be departing very soon to resume our daily lives. Uh, harking back to the invocation we heard tonight from Kathy Wendell's, this has been an evening of looking back, of honoring not just P.J. O'Rourke, who's with us tonight, but remembering the lives of Bob Novak and especially Joe Rago. But we're also looking forward, keeping alive their work, their dedication to good, solid journalism, and their presence in our lives, the lives of so many of us as family, friends, and colleagues. To our Novak fellows and to Elliot Kaufman, make us proud as you honor these legacies. To the rest of us, let us please continue to support these important programs. We at the Fund for American Studies are determined to ensure that these programs continue and that the Joseph Rago Fellowship for Excellence in Journalism becomes endowed and lives on in perpetuity, creating great journalism in this country. Thank you to the members of our host committee who are with us tonight, Steve Forbes, Catherine Mangu Ward, David Rivkin. We appreciate you lending your names to make this dinner a success. Thank you to Rick Graber and our other sponsors who are contributing to the Novak Fellowships through the Bradley Foundation, through the News Corp, Dow Jones, Wall Street Journal, Paul Jago, and all you have supported it. Please continue to do so and we'll continue to do our part to make sure these programs live on helping young people in the future. Thank you so much for being here. Travel safe.